Hey everybody. Sometimes I like to metaphorically speaking, take a few steps back before I take a step forward. Mechanically, that would sound a little weird. In fact, we have a trope in English about this. One step forward, two steps back which implies that while believing we are learning or growing or progressing, um, achieving, we're actually running away from, from that. <clears throat> And that trope isn't appropriate enough for many aspects of our common interactions with ideas, information, machines, each other, particularly, however, with nature. It's, it's like no steps forward, 900 steps back, 4,000 stories about it. <laughs> so, apparently we've, as a species, nearly completely defected on our actual relationships with the origins of our bodies and minds, moment to moment, not just over time instant to instant in what we refer to as the ecologies. And the result of this abandonment is endless pages of text and videos like this one and, you know, books of law that fail on purpose to have anything to do with correcting the course of our species as a as an animal in nature and in fact are going to and continually do and this is very obvious exacerbate the problems we've already <laughs> invented hummingbirds. <laughs> and so one can see this trend where the less we do, the more we talk. Or the more wrong we do, the more we pretend something else is going on. Now I'm speaking at the most general level of what I mean by we, which is essentially all human beings, but primarily I'm talking about institutional cultures, um, what we refer to as post-industrial societies, we could refer to them this way. And, uh, 
So this is quite ironic in the sense that over here, actually I want to put that on this other side. <laughs> over here, books and videos and movies and arguments and texts and laws pile up. And over here, the stuff they're pretending to be concerned about is falling off a cliff of extinction. And the more that happens on that side, the more this happens on this side. So you can see that we could understand the humans as reprocessing and lying about the most fundamental relationships upon which our lives and bodies and minds and even all of those institutional overlays and crusts depend. And as that is slaughtered, <clears throat> artifacts build up over here. And it's no accident that all of those artifacts are framed by rectangles. <laughs> we put little frames around them in books or on pages, right? Even electronic pages. Because one of the powers of the frame is to skip relationships skip time, skip responsibility, but also to keep us at arm's length from the death and suffering, the agony, the torture, the devastation that the fictions that are foundational to our post-industrial societies impose. And in case it isn't obvious, and I'm sure it's not visually obvious, right? It's not so you can instantly see a sort of model of this in your mind. But the damage that we do comes home to roost in us. And we have these ideas about cause and effect. And in a relatively limited terrain, they are valid. To the degree they are well informed and truthful and earnest and sincere. and are capable of bearing the complexity of the actual issues we hoped to gain insight into. And there's a vast terrain of rationales and arguments that do not have these qualities yet they present the appearance, right? So they're mimicking uh, things like complexity, intelligence, um, research, authority, sincerity, insight, and so on. And these are very simple things to mimic in abstract relationships where actions aren't, don't become for us the standards by which we evaluate talk. And of course there are, there are some kinds of talk 
whose validity ratio is relatively good. that do not require, in order to have that quality, that the one speaking lives up to, you know, checks every box and lives up to everything that they say. Because after all, we are all learning. And sometimes we can frame insight or understanding in our minds long before we're able to enact it. Now, of course, this leads to certain traps like all talk, no do. And the reason that I like to take a, a couple steps back sometimes before I begin the video and also to slow down is that my mind is easily excited by my pet project, right? whatever that might be. And so I can easily get tunnel vision, right? I can succumb to frame collapse so that my agenda, notice the phoneme for agent in there, can take over my awareness and my capacity to meander, right? To bird walk, to wander in and around the topics that I feel drawn toward uh, in the moment. So if I take a couple of steps back and slow down it's like having a little dream in the sense that some unnecessarily aggressive framing softens and becomes workable, malleable, transformable according to factors that are present in the moment and in my relationships here that are otherwise quite easily evicted. <laughs> the other day, a few weeks ago, while following my smartphone with an agenda, I stood directly on top of a yellow jacket nest. <laughs> because I was paying attention to the rectangle in my hand and my agenda, but not right, not, I was not present where I was, and I was partly not present in my body. Because when the rectangle comes out and I begin to speak into it, there's this, in, there are a variety of inflations, right, that I my ego and my ideological mind, my purposive aspect, my maker aspect, all these things kind of get lit up. And they can rapidly overwhelm awareness, presence, playfulness, learning, wonder, awe, mystery. So if I take a couple of steps back in my mind, in my awareness, I gain degrees of freedom that are otherwise inhibited or prohibited by mostly my habits, admittedly, um, but also by the gravity of we feel in our interiority when we're in the presence of a set of frameworks, some of them stand out to us. Um, we get excited and somewhat identified with them. And then we begin to collapse down to, well, what am I here for? And you can see this kind of collapse all the time 
in people who have despaired uh, or whose tunnel vision has become so extreme historically and habitually that they're like kind of like a bird with no legs and one wing or something you know, or a bird with no wings and one leg <laughs> um, which is really tragic not funny but you can hear this in phrases like well what am I supposed to be doing why am I here what's the use of this life. But such questions are also the result of a peculiar aspect of the failure to compose meaningful frames and generalizations in language that are very deceptive. When I hear phrases like this, my heart aches often because what I hear is something I myself have experienced and often experience. I remember meaningful relation. I remember deep, meaningful relation. And I do from my childhood with my family um, early experiences in nature, particularly with the ocean and the trees and the birds and the insects and the flowers and the fishes and the frogs and the clams, the praying mantises, the blue jays. <laughs> I remember meaningful relation, but I'm not experiencing any. All right. So what's the use? Of course, there is this utilitarian ethic that has intruded into our lives and language in an incredibly profuse collection of threats, many of which masquerade as convenience or wealth, abundance, safety, opportunity, they're mimics. There's all kinds of ways of weaponizing signals and qualities in today's information economy. And without coherent sense-making abilities, that are rich and communal and trustworthy, I'm afraid most of us are going to not merely become lost in the storm, but to become points of presence that feed and hyperbolize that storm and press for further frame collapse <clears throat> in whatever direction we become identified with due to our outrage or pain or concern or fear or ache or desire or favoritism or fashion. <laughs> In today's moment, this seems a precipice we're, that we're going to just keep falling off of en masse. Until and unless we begin doing something that more closely resembles sense-making, intelligent sense-making together with and for each other.
when we speak or post or write or lecture or teach we become transports across which a transfer occurs, right? There's a transference between the speaker, poster, or writer um, to those who observe or, or participate with them. And where the transfer contains content that's intelligent and earnest, thoughtful, mindful, insightful, creative, aware, playful. And we don't have to check every box, but the the boxes that correspond to something resembling truthfulness, right? We're not going to get at the truth. But where there's truthfulness and insight and intelligence, then that transfer, we, we might call it noble. <laughs> Maybe even sometimes heroic, because it can rescue people from traps that they would otherwise be subject to, and from lives that while they still may have value, have been robbed of many forms and aspects of value those lives might otherwise naturally sustain. And so to minds, and so to relationships, and so to society, and our social networks our actual ones, and the overlay of the electronic ones. Where that integrity is missing in the transfer, where it's been corrupted, intentionally or unintentionally, there are plenty of entirely sincere people that are just wrong. They have, they've, they've married an array of frames that can only collapse toward error, essentially, or mostly do. Where the content is poisoned, we, <coughs> we get malware. We get the psycho-emotional and cognitive and informational equivalent of a disease that's masquerading as a benefit. Why is it doing that? To evade whatever degree of immunity we may together or as individuals have acquired and assembled. Immunity to what? Immunity to malware masquerading as valid and valuable content. <laughs> Unfortunately for many of us, the model of the malware detector or the sort of analog, it's much more sophisticated than software, but the analog of protective software in our, in our minds, 
those behaviors that we engage in for those purposes for nearly all of us are incredibly clumsy filled with errors um, filled with mistaken assumptions filled with mistaken ha with habits that, that merely get us into trouble um, and filled with histories of having failed to disambiguate malware from content productively and thus have, you know, we became the point, a new point of presence for the malware, right? And we shout it from the mountaintops today, <laughs> some of us, many of us. So, as a people, we don't yet have anything that's really good at deflecting malware. And even in science, and it's really easy to misunderstand me here and presume that I'm saying science isn't trustworthy. That's not what I'm saying at all. But there are problems with science and that it's deconstructive and materialist, takes things apart into parts, suggests theories, gets it wrong, particularly in terms of biology quite often, though much more rarely with germ theory and stuff. It's a mixed bag. Um, and one of the problems that isn't immediately apparent is that science, as we practice it today, is both very young and shot through with shoddy research, bad axioms, bad motivations, bad actors, commercial purposes, outright errors, and we, the common people, are not equipped to evaluate those things very well. So if we just say, in a very blatant way, you know, well, let's trust science, <laughs> that's not going to work. Though there are contexts in which um, reasonable trust, a reasonable degree of trust in the best and earnest efforts of researchers who come to the questions with humility and integrity, that stuff's got a lot less malware associated with it. And often represents what we can refer to as best intelligence. So the fact that some science gets it wrong and there's confusing origin stories for different research, so on, should not suggest to us that we should dismiss science. What it, what it suggests to us is that people who have studied topics their entire lives, as they form consensus and argue among each other, whose credentials are clear from the work they've actually done that, that is truthful, in a situation where we have to disambiguate things that are inaccessible to our intelligence, we should be willing to pay careful attention to the experts in those fields. Um, so that we acquire something that approaches understanding over time, right? It approaches it over time. The understandings get clarified. And gives us the capacity at least to try to make informed decisions.
there's all kinds of trouble with the materialistic, deconstructive aspects of science. However, in a situation like a pandemic, there's still an extremely high noise floor. Um, and that's partly because information's being weaponized and turned into malware all over the place around us. But again, um, together, carefully, we can find a path through that toward voices and consensus that represent best intelligence, meaning this is the best we've got right now. It may not be complete. We might find out part of it's wrong later. Um, but if we're going to make informed decisions, you know, here's the information that has risen above the war zone right, and demonstrated validity, integrity, um, humility, right, no grandstanding, I'm going to get into that in a minute, Even if our science is young and clumsy and sometimes mispurposed, it's one of the best and most effective and efficient ways we can make sense of the phenomenon that are appropriate to its scope. Phenomenon such as epidemics. or pollution or <clears throat> the great big red herring climate change <laughs> climate change is sort of the, the capitalism word for we've been poisoning the fuck out of the foundations of the ecologies worldwide on purpose for the past 200 years, but in the past 50, that process has amplified itself geometrically over incredibly short spans of time. That's what the foundation of our concern, that's what we should be looking directly, honestly, sincerely at, that's what we should be understanding because climate change and by this we mean two things whatever might be naturally going on in the earth's cycles and in in the sun's cycles and the earth's relationship with the sun Although that idea presumes, like, like that's a kind of false dichotomy because it presumes that we're not involved in that relationship. Yet we are, as a species, and even as individuals. So there's that aspect, right? There's the, the sort of natural transformations of the atmosphere and the ozone layer and Earth's magnetic field and the sun and its cycles, the earth and her cycles, how these mesh together and integrate to produce transformations in environments over time. But then there's the fact that humans have been dumping all kinds of industrial chemistry um, It gets complex here, it can get complex. So there's the question of anthropogenic driven, right? Climate change, human driven climate change, human induced climate change. And there's, you know, both things are happening. Ordinarily, the ecologies are robust enough to shield us from a sudden shocking transformation 
in the Earth-Sun relationship. Since we've torn that buffer apart, it may w very well turn out that the buffer will turn against us. Not because of some vengeful spirit in the Earth, necessarily, but rather just as a natural consequence of our behavior. You know, like a like a guy who's sawing on the rope of the bridge he's walking across, right? Eventually that thing just flips to the side and dumps him off. <laughs> um, that kind of thing. But I want to be really clear about the red herring. The climate is changing. Our species has a role in in the origins of that change. But whether or not that's even an issue, and I, I think personally, it seems very likely to me that it is, it's highly probable. Um, what's actually going on that's a fact is that we're obliterating the foundations of the remaining ecologies on purpose, 24 7, 365, in ways that multiply in and accelerate in frequency and damage geometrically over time. That's what's being hidden by the fish, right? That's what the fish is hiding. That herring. So that's another way of using mimicry, right? We can refocus or misdirect attention from something that would otherwise be blatantly obvious and get everybody arguing about, you know, one branch on the tree of the problem whose roots and trunk we became. <laughs> and so we can, you know, direct attention away from our action and responsibility and from the possibility of intelligent response to crisis. And in case it isn't clear, that one capacity of insightful, intelligent response during crisis is presently one of the most precious projects we can undertake together. This imperative is urgent now and will remain that way for a long time to come, presuming that there is time to come for us. So, I've been talking lately a lot about frames and frameworks, frame collapse, rectangles, angles of approach, perspective. If you orbit an object, what you see will change as the angle of perspective changes. And in, this is more true in our minds, but we're not or orbiting objects. We're orbiting ideas. <laughs> or declarations, or concepts, or models, or theories, or beliefs, or grudges, fears, grievances, hopes, desires, all these things. Most of us are not skillful at orbiting. We find one or two angles where we like what we see, and we collapse the circle to defend those angles, to identify with them, and so on. And this we think of, somehow, as being associated with correct. Notice the rect in there, the rectitude, the wreckage, the rectangle. Um, and so there are these little storms of points of presence with people shouting things at each other. 
who believe that they are right that they they speak with the voice that one would use if one was God right? it's the God voice the novel coronavirus is a hoax really well I mean if you want to get right down to it language is a hoax so let's start there if they can make godlike statements I can too Right. This is how the disease spreads. But I do wish to suggest that language is, unless used with great care and awareness, it's self-ironizing, right? But we hear these voices. We hear people and groups speaking as if they know what's right. And not merely do they know what's right, they're going to tell other people what's right. <laughs> Boy, there's a whole bunch of thorny, nightmarish, tangled wrecks in that mess. Um. <laughs> I'm not even sure where to start, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it, I'm going to have a go at it. <laughs> In nearly all cases, that's not really true. In, in many cases, there's a simple sort of derivable perspective um, that is truthful enough that we can place our trust in it. For example, if I drop an apple, if it slips out of my hand, I can say, oops, I dropped the apple. And, you know, the context is simple enough, right, that the truth value of my statement is pretty high. It might not be perfect, but it's good enough, right? But in very complex situations, understanding the truth value of some statement or concept or model or language or death declaration is vastly more complex. And in these situations, most of them are the result of something resembling frame collapse, right? Um, we've thrown away the complexity, we've pretended to omnipotent perspective, and someone declares, no, this is absolutely true that whatever masks don't help limit the contagion of a virus for example airborne virus um, so that's a really interesting phenomenon and there's so much going on there uh, that like there's there's authorization ploys and humans are fundamentally vulnerable to authorization and there's power transfer, right, between the originator of some declaration and those who propagate it. Um, there's other kinds of power transfer going on. It's very, very sophisticated and has little to do with, it's not even possible that it's, you know, in many, in many cases, it's not even possible that such, direct, such declarations even resemble truthfulness. In the first place, few of them were made from a place of integrity and actual sincerity um, from, from broad awareness. Uh, uh, 
and from deeply informed perspectives that have an open mind around their topic, right, and can orbit it um, very sensitively and perceptively. So one of the things we're seeing right now is this explosion of little God voices all over the place. This is right, that is wrong, and blah, 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 blah. A bunch of babble. Um, but it's very dangerous babble. And there are all kinds of malignant purposes behind a lot of it, even if some of it is relatively innocent, in the sense of not, not having a covert goal to manipulate or deceive. Um, you know, I cribbed the phrase from Jordan Peterson, who I find very interesting, even though there's lots of stuff I don't agree with him about. But I cribbed the phrase, um, most ideas are wrong. And it's a pretty good starting place. Most ideas start out in error. And if we recognize that, then we might take a couple steps back before we start championing one. We might maintain a sense of humility in the face of the actual complexity of you know, human existence and minds and our bodies. And I'm gonna explain a little bit about why most ideas are wrong. So, it wasn't wrong that antibiotics could cure certain infections. But that idea led us to think of microbes as enemies, when it turns out they comprise 50 to 60% of our body cells. So you can see how the in careful promotion of an idea that has mechanical purchase on health turns into an, like, an array of nightmares. It, it will be 50 to 100 to 300 years before we even understand them at this late date. Some, a photographer was like staring at me very suspiciously because she thought I was filming her because I'm holding my rectangle. And for her, that collapses into the frame of I'm being filmed. Someone's holding a rectangle, which is kind of a bizarre concern for someone who's carrying around um, <laughs> an exceptionally sophisticated telephoto camera. <laughs> um, but interesting nonetheless. If we make a circle of everything that can be known, and within that we make a circle of everything that can be known from Earth, that second circle is going to be incredibly small. Even though we presume that the laws of physics, quote unquote, I'd love to know why they're called laws. They should be called propensities or something. Because um, they're definitely not laws, whatever they might be. We, we presume that the laws of physics, as we have come to understand, very and completely understand them, apply everywhere in time space, and I'm pretty sure we've got that wrong. But they might apply most places in a given layer we can explore with ideas and mathematics and experiments and so on. Um, so, the circle of 
all that can be known, the circle of all that can be known from Earth, the circle of all that can be known by human beings. We keep getting tinier and tinier circles. Um, but we're going to stay inside the circle of things that can be known on Earth. Inside that circle, human knowledge represents something unimaginably smaller than 1% grasp. Like point zero 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 one, something like this. So the idea that um, an idea is authoritative is a relative idea in most contexts. There are a few exceptions. There are edge cases where, you know, the idea is reasonably authoritative within the context. in which it's applicable. So, of what we might know as a species, we know nearly nothing. And of things like biology, the immune system, the brain, the body, the complexity is staggering beyond our capacity to imagine. Um, the activity of a single cell over one second is unimaginably complex. Of course, depending on how, you know, how we use the macro microscope, right? Depending on, it's not too hard to watch what a cell physically does over a second in terms of, you know, from the macro level where we see the cell, but it's really hard to understand what the cell, what the cell's doing at the membrane and inside itself over that second. So the thing I want to highlight here is that our actual acquired knowledge is unimaginably less sophisticated. Well, I keep using that word. Um, profoundly less sophisticated than uh, <laughs> than the suppositions at play when we begin declaring the truth of incredibly complex matters. But there's another problem with the truth. We have this propensity to skip over relations, skip over time, skip over work, skip over responsibility, skip over living places, skip over the fact that we're animals, and collapse the frame into a known, a known thing. I know this. And the problem with that is that Truth is transformed by relation, right? We learn things by relation, and there aren't any truths we don't learn, right? Um, unless we're referring to those that are unknown. So as a relationship proceeds, the arbiters of truthfulness and integrity and validity transform in the relation. And when the scientist takes the mouse out of nature into the lab, that's a transformation. Right? That changes the scientist, it changes the mouse. It changes the manifold of relation. And if they kill the mouse and examine its organs, looking for example for evidence of infection with a pathogen they introduced to its body, then that manifold collapses, it's gone. Um, so we can kill relation to get knowledge. And in case it isn't clear, if one's goal is to pimp one's predictive abilities, right? Say, I'm a really good predictor, my knowledge is good, because it predicts things well which is part of what's going on with human representational intelligence in general. 
there's a peculiar feature of that process that's easily overlooked, and it goes something like this. The more stuff I kill, the more predictable things become. And if I can kill it all the way back to just a dead frame in space-time, my prediction becomes nearly perfect. <laughs> right? I'm, I'm evicting relationships, and as I evict and destroy and obliterate relationships, my predictive power becomes better and better. So if I'm really excited about being a good predictor, a great way to do that is just kill up a bunch of things. Kill up as much as you can. And the more you kill, the better your predictions work. Because you're actually physically evicting organismal complexity and relational complexity and bio, um, bio-relational co- complexity, hyperstructures of awareness and consciousness and ecologies. You're gonna burn all that down, right? End the relationship. And the result is knowledge. And you can see something like this in cancel culture. Um, You can see this incredible display of rectitude, of rightness. We know what's correct um, for everyone, right? Uh, And this isn't to say that, you know, most estranged or bizarre or hyperbolic cultural movements, they've got like a, a poison pill wrapped around something that it's actually important and reasonable and true or has integrity, right? So they just wrap malware around that little core and then sort of send it out. And and the malware is extremely attractive because it presents with the face of that core of moral or ethical concern, intent, history, so on. And that having that that core thing that we might want to actually acknowledge together, both keeps it in circulation and is used as a defense against competing malware and critical inquiry. Right? Um, and when I say critical in- inquiry, I'm imagining something pursued with uh, earnest humility and integrity and the desire to learn and discover and to gain insight and understanding together, which can be enacted together for each other, altruistically. So you can see this this sort of bubbling volcano of rightness in modern human cultural communication and all kinds of bizarre little backwaters of that including um, trolling and sophisticated misdirection and all kinds of stuff, right? There's this huge landscape there. (laughs) But what our species actually has a grasp on is very, very little. And we have this other problem, which is that we generalize to produce knowledge. So we talk about normative cases. We talk about the median. We talk about the average. Um, And that's a statistical game that while not, not unuseful, is totally deceptive if we start trying to get, for example, um, if we start demanding that people that a certain kind of behavior is normal and another kind is abnormal. Uh, Even though it's sensible statistically, it's often wrong three other ways. And the reason is that each individual human being in each moment of their life and each day of their life, though some of us transform more than others in time or, or, you know, in context, and some of us transform more quickly than others, and some of us transform more slowly than others. 
you know, we are all adjusting to environment and context ceaselessly all the time. And sometimes that's a very painful adjustment for many of us. Um, and some of those contexts are actually cruel or inhuman or misguided or malignant. But if we look at, um, if we take like neurotypicals and we actually look closely at individuals, what we're going to find is this astonishing variance of what it means to be quote unquote neurotypical. And if we look at people who for one analytic or diagnostic reason or another um, are seen or declared to be outside that group, and we have diagnostic categories for this, which are confusing and clumsy and bizarre, but also allow the possibility of some adjustment for uniqueness to be made, while at the same time allowing for the possibility of kind of the destruction of the people who are not neurotypical, um, we're going to find the same thing with them. We're going to find radical variation person to person, even while we find uh, shared criteria in terms of that which, with which someone identified a person as being non-neurotypical. So my point is that generalizations grant us some degree of convenience, but they also do a bunch of skipping. They skip the complexity and the meaningful interiority that is actually more true than the generalizations because it's more complex and broader in individual situations and cases and circumstances. So we're misled by generalizations. In every particular place where there's a living being, the living being is being transformed and transforming relationships. Now, that's an extremely broad generalization, so it feels relatively safe for me to make it. But to declare the truth for all people is too often an act of ignorant hubris and frame collapse and identification with the result of that collapse and the intent to transmit that collapse to others under the auspices of valorous action, right? Pretending to be valorous pretending to be noble, pretending to be well-intentioned. That's not sincerity. That's not integrity. That's deception. And even if one is sincere, it's really easy to become the avatar of one's favored frame collapse moments and go around declaring things. Um, I've seen guys declare that the earth is flat, that in space there is no light. Um, and, and other very confusing ideas. It was very bold of Peterson to say most ideas are wrong, but this, these things that, that I've reflected on help, to help us to understand why that's true. What he really means is even where they have elements that are correct, the applicable scope of that correctness is so narrow when compared to what can be known, that we'd be wrong to stop there, right? We'd be wrong to subscribe to that frame collapse and go like, oh yeah, it's true 
that, insert some statement of, you know, fact advertising here. Now there's a, there's a trope here that I'm trying to communicate and I can't find another way to do it, but um, I'm gonna paraphrase a story about when the humans first came to perhaps the North American continent and a colloquium of the animals got together and realized that the humans are incredibly vulnerable but they're also incredibly dangerous. And in this case, in this story, the otter says, well, let's just kill them all and be done with it. They're dangerous, it's true. And if we don't act now, we may not have another chance. But the beaver, who has a important role in the sense of being the one that is the, the kind of the origin point in the circle of relation, the one who directs the living waters, says, no, I don't think that's a good idea. If we do that, they will hate us and hunt us forever. We will start a war that has no end. I think we should enter into a living relationship with the humans. And this is the difference between, you can see what's going on here, right? If the animals make that cut in the story, ka-ching, right? The humans, are, the humans are bad. Well, then that turns out to become true. But it's not clear that it's true of the humans or all the humans, it's a generalization. But what it does is it ends the relational manifold, it frames it, it makes that cut, and it has the project of potentially inter uh, eternalizing that, that frame, that cut. And the beaver says, no, let's, let's stay in play. Let's discover what's actually going on. Let's not start on the side of war. Let's recognize the humans as animals and to the degree we are able, welcome them into living relation with our peoples and the living places. And that's a different kind of truth. It's not declarative. Yes, it's not perfectly disambiguated. And it, remain, it has all kinds of open aspects that represent degrees of liberty which are lost when we suddenly know the truth that the humans are dangerous, which turns out to be pretty darn true. <laughs> um, <laughs> we better hope the animals don't revisit that colloquium because if they do, <laughs> the beaver's gonna have a rough time reprising that argument, I think. But this story isn't just about animals and humans, it's about the nature of knowledge and decision-making. It's about frames and their collapse and what happens when they collapse and why in most cases it's imperative to preserve the spaciousness, the opportunities for mutual understanding and awareness and learning and an actual advancement by not collapsing, yeah. And as I said, many of the ideas that are wrong, it's not as though they have no useful content. Often there are aspects of content in ideas that are wrong that we can make intelligent use of. And this, 
I'm going to crib a little bit from Eric Weinstein here when he talks about dining a la carte. In this context, what he means by this language is noticing in the content being transferred from people with whom we might otherwise not agree at all or even aggressively disagree noticing in the content elements retrievable intelligence that is truthful and valuable and insightful and, and useful and you know creative wise so that the other day when someone asked me you know, do you, have you watched Jordan Peterson? And I said, yes, I think he's brilliant. I, I got this incredible reaction of, you're kidding, right? You know, but no, I'm not kidding. And it's because I'm used to dining a la carte. Many of the most brilliant people we will come across in our lives are still human. They're not perfect. They don't know the truth. But many of them have a passion for traveling in the direction of truthfulness. And they're going to make all kinds of mistakes along that path that they might just a few years later correct or transform. If we decide to cancel them, then we miss out on their mistakes and their triumphs. And we presume that they're a bad human being. Well, how the fuck are we supposed to learn in an environment like that? So I really like Eric's idea and it's one I've, I've practiced for a long time because some of the people I most admire have said things I absolutely disagree with. If I had to cancel them, <laughs> evict them from transfer with me, there would be no, nearly no one I could learn with or receive knowledge from in, for example, in academic culture and in books. So the, you know, the, the opposite idea, the idea that, well, this person has to check every one of my boxes before I can sign up. While it might not be inappropriate in a very narrow set of cases, very small set it's not <laughs> it seems wildly unreasonable to me um, and completely confused outside of those contexts in which it might be necessary or appropriate and those are very few compared to the way this idea is being uh, promulgated right Furthermore, I don't want others to decide whose voice I get to hear. Now, there might be cases in which I'm happy to stop hearing some specific voice because I truly detest it or think it actively malignant. But even then, I might want to hear it because I would want to understand the ways in which it warps truth and value and integrity to form its message, right? I would want to be able to be educated by it, not merely to have no access to it. Because I'm trying to understand what it means to have a mind and what our actual opportunities are as human beings, whether we're alone or together, and in the ways in which we are together. So, part of me feels really happy when I hear that somebody who was saying something that's completely wrong minded has been you know <laughs> has been snipped off the tree of the majority of existing social networks which are fucking corporate owned propaganda machines anyway um, part of me feels good when I when I hear that somebody I really don't like uh, has been prohibited 
from a platform, but another part of me and the one that I trust more <clears throat> is very suspicious about that because extrapolate, right? Um, if we extrapolate this behavior, and this is part of rectitude, right? This is the, I keep saying this right. <laughs> this is part of, you know, correctness. Eventually, we only hear the voices of primarily the most successful malware. That's what's going to win there. Not actual intelligence or integrity or sincerity or, um, you know, informed p opinion or critical awareness. No, no. No, we're going to get... <laughs> That process produces extremely virulent, self-enhancing malware as minds in human beings. Or as the artifacted, as the skeletal remains of what would have otherwise become minds in human beings. It's frame collapse. And it is as if there are something analogous to organisms competing, I call them thrisps, to dominate the transports between human minds, which I call the mimula, and use humans as reproductive organs. This is a very useful perspective. I'm not advocating that we take it absolutely literally or that it's concretely true, but that we entertain it. Because if we do, we can see that, we can see what the sort of behavior and goal, goal uh, targets are for these kinds of organism-like processes in human social cognition and in personal human cognition. And so if we think of the field of all human minds will limit it for the moment just to those alive right now, but it's not limited that way. Because you speak language, right? <laughs> you didn't invent language, did you? <laughs> no, and you didn't invent your specific language either, no. But, but we'll look at just those, lives, those, those humans alive right now and imagine that they're, all those minds together form a field that transform the units and the transports and the structures within that field constantly and ceaselessly. And thrisps, ideas, concepts, nomenclature, um, <laughs> the claim to rightness or truth, uh, these are competing in that network to own the transports and to be propagated by humans and groups. And someone could say, well, it's just meme theory, but I'm like, no, they're not just viruses, they're, they're, they're more like animals. And there are good thrisps. In fact, there are thrisps that take down malware networks, <laughs> right? But there are also thrisps that protect malware networks um, in this model, which is really just a toy something unimaginably complex and with layers we don't even have language about. Now, I'm trying to learn to better understand the topics I'm reflecting on here. I'm not presenting you with finished knowledge. I'm taking a walk on a landscape that I spend time in because I'm concerned about these matters and I'm concerned about life on earth and I'm concerned about the nature of human consciousness and what it means to have a mind and I'm concerned for the ecologies and I'm also concerned for the humans who are acting like incredibly naive children who have no parents, right? And they were, they were bequeathed this unimaginable treasure of a living world, and they just started ripping it apart for, you know, turning it into objects. Something happened. 
to those humans. Something that perhaps resembles an accident in which our minds lost not merely half their previous complexity, but maybe two thirds, because I think there were other participants in our original complexity. There's good evidence for this in my view. So now I'm trying to understand the origins of the accident, if I think of it in this way, and the histories it gave birth to and the transformations that occurred over the evolution of human consciousness. And I think we're in a particularly dark moment because although our species has acquired incredible technical knowledge, it has lost its orienting It has lost the precious orienting perspectives and insights and concerns that invest knowledge with meaning, with integrity. <clears throat> so in a way we've disintegrated while leaping forward over time in relationships technologically. And this disintegration is now, and it's always been, but it's very obviously now reflecting back into us. And we as people are disintegrating, at least here in the United States. I want to show you this very small pipevine swallowtail caterpillar that is probably going to shed its skin and make a chrysalis. And I just placed one of these that was wandering on the path on a leaf. Here's another one. And actually, I just went through a little technical crisis where I thought I lost that entire video. <laughs> that was super fun. Um, but I was mistaken. Where is the leaf? Well, it's okay. So, these are things that fascinate me, and that's why I'm exploring. And part of how they came to fascinate me was that I had... An, an experience that transcended everything I thought was possible for me in my mind. And in some ways, it may have resembled awakening <clears throat> the potential that was embodied in our distant ancestors, those two-thirds that were lost as we became, as we sort of kept doubling down on representational thought, language, techni, disintegration, materialism, dissection, so on. There aren't really any parts here. except to the mind that intends to impose them. And unfortunately, we moderns are trained to use representational intelligence to dice up reality in according to little frameworks that we're trained to employ, and then to analyze the results. That's a very effective procedure for producing analytical knowledge. It's a catastrophic procedure for engaging in relationships. One we should take great care to avoid, I think. In the proper contexts, this is how things roll. As someone who loves organisms, 
I'm not happy with how science treats biology at all. And I've heard all kinds of arguments that privilege the humans above the other creatures or that say, you know, we can sacrifice this little fish um, or this mouse. It can live its entire life in the lab and be tortured, tortured or diseased or just killed or dissected because it's worth it to get the knowledge. That sets a dangerous precedent too, doesn't it? Because where will we stop? And what's the actual value of this knowledge, right? And what are we sacrificing? What are we overlooking? when we make this choice. It's okay if some disagree with my concern. I have no wish to enforce my concern on others, but I can share it as part of just being honest. I'm grateful that I didn't lose the video <laughs> and that perhaps some of you will see it soon. For now, thank you for joining me. I look forward to further adventures together. Bye-bye for now.